Praise the Lord, everybody. Pastor Jared here. I am so glad to be able to come to you once again today uh, to be able to discuss the Word of God with you. Uh, it is always my pleasure, my honor to be able to do so. I pray that you all are doing well today. I pray that everything is going uh, well with you and yours. Um, I did want to talk to you again today. I'm going to be doing a series for this whole week. Uh, building one piece upon another about the hope of the resurrection. Um, of course, we know that there's a lot of discussion concerning uh, death uh, with this virus going around. And, uh, and of course, people have been dying since Adam fell uh, because the Bible said, by one man's sin, death passed upon all and that all have sinned. And uh, so we understand that that's part of life. Uh, death is a natural part of life. It's going to happen. We're all going to have to face it. It's appointed unto man once to die. Uh, but it doesn't end there. The Bible said, but after this, the resurrection or the judgment. And so I want to I take us through a few more scriptures today. Uh, and then we'll continue to go on through the rest of this week uh, until Friday uh, discussing the hope of the resurrection. So we're just going to talk about part two. Now, I do want to read a scripture. I didn't read it yesterday uh, purposefully because I wanted to read it today uh, to tie into yesterday. And if you go with me to Daniel 12 and verse 1, uh, the Bible said, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, uh, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be written, found written in the book. Praise God. We know when the books are open, and that's in Revelation 20. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And of course, these echo the words of Jesus Christ in John 5, when he said there is coming a day when all who are in the graves shall hear his voice and come forth, they which have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they which have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Jesus is not changing Daniel's position. He didn't change Job's position. He didn't change Isaiah's position. In fact, Jesus continued uh, once again to go down that line uh, of thought that all that are in the graves, all that sleep in the dust is what Daniel says, Job said, oh, that thou would hide me in the grave, that thou would keep me in secret uh, until the wrath be overpassed. Um, so ultimately, we understand uh, that those who die are waiting for something. They're waiting for something. Uh, it's not happened yet. Uh, we don't preach the doctrine of Hymenaeus and Philetus around here that the resurrection had already overpassed or rather that people were already being raised from the dead. Uh, we understand that there's something to come. It's going to happen. We're looking forward to something. So today I just want to go through several scriptures. I've got quite a few, so hold on. Don't get in a super hurry today. Uh, if you are in a hurry, please come back and watch it so that uh, you can maybe follow along as we continue this pattern going toward um, uh, going toward Friday. Uh, but again, Daniel said, all that are sleeping in the dust, they are going to, some are going to raise to everlasting life. Others will raise to shame and everlasting contempt. And then, of course, we know uh, that uh, Jesus said, those that are in the graves uh, shall hear his voice and come forth. They which have done good unto the resurrection of life. They which have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Ezekiel talks about that in Ezekiel 37. Uh, and at some point here in the next few days, we're going to talk about the great army uh, that Ezekiel mentioned in Ezekiel, the 37th chapter because we see that great army also again in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation. So let's talk about what are we looking for? Now, as children of God, are we looking to die and to go to heaven? Is that what we're looking for? Is that the context of all of the writings of the apostles? What were they pointing the church toward, especially Paul, who was the preacher of the resurrection? What are they pointing the church toward? Well, we'll start with Titus here, uh, too. Paul's writing to his son Titus, uh, who they believe became the Bishop of Crete. Uh, and he says here in verse 11, he said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, 
righteously and godly in this present world. Okay, for what? What are we looking for? He tells us, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So he said, we are looking for something. We're looking towards something. It hasn't happened. At this point, many of the saints have died. Many saints were dying. Many saints would die. And if Paul understood something other than the appearing of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead, he would have told us. But he's continuing to affirm this idea that we are looking for something. He said, I, he said, I, forgetting those things which are behind, he said, I reach to those things which are before. I'm pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. So go with me to 1 Timothy 6. And we're going to start reading. Um, let's see here. I think I may have written that down wrong. What a shock. I'm sorry, let's go to 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1. And we're going to start at verse 8. Paul said, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord Jesus Christ, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, which has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So he said the first thing that happened is Jesus appears and he brings the understanding of life and immortality by the gospel. And so we're looking forward to something. He first appeared to give us the gospel. Now we're looking for him to do something else. And Paul talks about this in 2 Timothy 4, uh, which is his last epistle here. He's getting ready uh, to be offered. He's getting ready uh, to die. He understands that. Uh, he says, number one, in first, 2 Timothy 4, 1, he said, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick or the alive and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He's going to judge those who are dead and alive at his appearing and his kingdom. It hasn't taken place yet. It hasn't taken place previously. It is not taking place right now. There is a judgment coming. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this is the judgment. But when does that judgment happen? Paul said at uh, he said, at his appearing and his kingdom, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who ju shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Did you hear that? He's judging them at his appearing and his kingdom. Now, hold on to that, because we're going to talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. Now, if you go down to verse six, he says, for I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He said, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. When is that day? He tells us in verse one, his appearing and his kingdom at that day. And he said, and not unto me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Are you, are you following this? He's continuing to let us know that there's something going to take place at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He's not saying look forward, look forward to dying, going to heaven and be with Jesus. He said, look for the appearing of Jesus Christ. Look for his coming. Look for his kingdom. He's giving the church eyes to see futuristically, not presently or historically. He's trying to get them to look toward the coming of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, let's go to 1 Peter Let's talk to Peter about this as well. Let's go to 1 Peter, the first chapter, and we're starting at the third verse. He said, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his 
abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That goes back to John 6. Jesus said, I will raise him up in the last day. When, is, when are we going to get our, 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 our reward? He's going to give us a crown of life in that day. When? When he shall judge the alive, the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. All of this is futuristically, saints of God. It's not something that's taking place right now. It's something that will take place. And of course, if we go to Romans 8, and I know this may sound redundant, but what I want you, I want you to understand is sometimes we're trying to get people to look for something that has happened or is happening that is actually not yet happened. We're looking for the return of Jesus Christ. We're looking for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We're looking for the resurrection of the dead. He will come and his rewards will be with him and he will reward every man according as his work shall be. That is going to happen at his appearing and his kingdom. So we're looking forward to something. We're looking, we're continually being pushed. Our, our, our spiritual vision is continually being pushed toward the coming of Jesus Christ. And of course, Romans 8, so powerful, so incredible here. Uh, he says here in Romans, uh, the eighth chapter, uh, he said, for I reckon uh, in verse 18, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory uh, with the glory that shall be revealed in us for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's not something that's happening right now. That's not something that has happened. The manifestation of the sons of God is at the resurrection when he shall change our body, our vile body, and give us a body like unto his glorious body. He said, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who is subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. The moment we are set free from, 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 from the curse, uh, us as humanity, creation will be delivered at the same time. He said, because the creature itself also, uh, uh, in verse 21, shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. He said, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is not hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth. Why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that, which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. He said, we're waiting for this culminative act, this absolute finality of the redemption of our body that's what we're looking forward to now go with me to first corinthians 15 now in verse let's start verse 21 paul says for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now listen, here's where the key is. But every man in his own order. So in other words, the resurrection has an order to it. And we all will resurrect in our order. And here is the order. Christ the first fruits. Christ has already been raised from the dead. Then afterward, they that are Christ or they that belong to Christ, they will resurrect when? At his coming. And so we have to understand he's continually, Paul is continually pointing us toward the future. Peter is pointing us toward the future. Job pointing us toward the future. Ezekiel and Daniel pointing us toward the future. Isaiah pointing us toward the future. All of this is pointing toward the second return or the second advent of Jesus Christ, his earthly return 
to uh, or his 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 uh, his return to the earth. We're waiting for the return of Christ, his appearing and his kingdom. Now, he said, we're waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So we have to talk about that. I want to go to one more scripture before we do that, but you will be coming back to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. But if you go to uh, Philippians 3 and verse 20, Paul said, for our conversation is in heaven or our citizenship. We are fellow citizens with the saints in light. For whence we also look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. So he said, our citizenship is, hev is in heaven, from whence we also look. We're looking for something. We're looking for the appearing of Jesus Christ. We're looking for the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the Savior, uh, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. We are waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. And so Paul says, look, here church in Philippi, we're looking for that glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We're looking for him. We're, we're expecting him. Our expectation is that he's going to come. And when he gets here, he's going to change our vile body and give us a body like and unto his glorious body. Now go back with me to 1 Corinthians 15. And we're going to go down to verse 50. Now Paul is not talking about the state of mind that we're in. He's not talking about the spirit. We can't, we can't metaphor and type this. He's literally talking, saints of God, about the body. He's talking about this flesh and blood, literal body. He's not talking about a consciousness somewhere. He said, now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. He's not talking about a corrupted conscience. He's not talking about a corrupted spirit. He's talking about a body that can decay. He's talking about, and, and you say, how do you know that, Pastor? Because it was prophesied of Christ. He said, thou wilt not leave my soul in hell or in the grave, neither will thy suffer thine holy one to see corruption. In other words, you will not allow me to stay in the grave long enough for my body to begin to decay, which we know did not take place. Jesus resurrected on the third day. The, the, the decay of the body had not yet begun to take place. So it fulfilled the prophecy that Christ would not be left in the grave, nor would his body begin to decay. And he's using the same terminology here. He said, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. In other words, this body cannot take on immortality. He said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. If you remember, he's going to judge the alive and the dead or the alive and the sleep at his appearing and his kingdom. We're not all going to sleep. We're not all going to die and sleep. Some of us are going to be alive at the coming of the Lord. And I'm gonna show you that here in just a moment. He said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, when is the change going to take place? It's not taking place right now. Nobody is in heaven with an immortal body. Nobody has taken that body yet. Nobody has, new body. He said, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed when? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible or immortal and we shall be changed who are alive at the coming of the Lord. He said, so, uh, he said, for this corruptible must put on incorruption. This body that is subject to the curse, decay and disease cannot take on immortality. 
We have to have a body that is incorruptible, that is incapable of disease, that is incapable of decay, that is incapable of death. We have to have a body that is immortal. We have to have a body that cannot be affected by the elements of this earth. It is a body not made of the dust. The first time that God created man, he created him of the dust of the, of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living soul. The second time, Paul said, we have borne the image of the earthly. He said, so shall we also bear the image of the heavenly. The Lord has a body prepared for me. He has a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, prepared for me. And I know when this earthly tabernacle is dissolved, at the coming of Jesus Christ, he is going to clothe me with an immortal, incorruptible body. He said, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have been put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. In other words, where there is immortality, death no longer has authority. As far as I can tell, I don't care how saintly people live. I don't care how sanctified they are. They're dying. People are still dying. This body is still dying because we must put off this tabernacle. We must put off this cloak and we must put on another body, an immortal body, an incorruptible body. This is going to happen at the last trump. All right. This is going to happen. The Bible says that the Lord is going to come with a great sound of a trumpet and he's going to resurrect the dead. That's what the scripture tells us. Uh, Paul is telling us here that our bodies will be changed, that the dead will be raised at the last trumpet. Now, I want you to go with me to Revelation, the 10th chapter. I'm sorry, the 11th chapter. Well, actually, let's go back to the 10th chapter here because I want to read something to you. If I can find it. Yes. Revelation 10, verse 7. He said, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel... When he shall begin to sound, this is the seventh trumpet, all right? The seven seals have now all been opened, and the seven thunders have uttered their voice. The seven trumpets are being blown. We've had one trump, trumpet one, trumpet two, trumpet three, trumpet four, trumpet five, trumpet six, and now we have come to the seventh angel. And he says here, and, 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 uh, and he says, but in the days of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he declared it to his servants, the prophets. Now go with me to Revelation 11 and verse 15. Now listen, in the days of the seventh angel, when you hear the sound of the seventh angel, the mystery of God is finished. In other words, this is the last trumpet. Christ is returning at the last trumpet. We're going to be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. He said in verse 15 of Revelation, and the seventh angel sounded and there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. This seventh angel, the seventh last trumpet sounds and the kingdoms of this world, the kingdoms of men become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Going back to Daniel 12, going back to 1 Corinthians 15, the last trumpet. And that day, Michael the archangel shall stand for his people and many that sleep in the dust shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and contempt. And then Jesus says, uh, there is coming a day when all that are in the grave shall hear the voice uh, or hear his voice and come forth and shall, uh, some shall come forth to the resurrection of life, others to the resurrection of damnation. So this is all beginning to culminate and come together at the second return of Jesus Christ at the last trumpet. This all comes together in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. And we're starting at the 13th verse. This all comes together. The whole thought of this really resonates here in 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter and the 13th verse, starting there. 
He said, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He said, in other words, I don't want you to be ignorant. I don't want you to misunderstand what's happening right now concerning those which are asleep in Christ. He said, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Now that is what's going to happen, all right? Now he takes verse 15 down and he begins to tell us how uh, verse 14 and verse 13 are going to be accomplished. He said, for, he said, I'm telling you this because we say unto you by the word of the Lord. We've heard this from the Lord himself, John 5, John 6. We can continue to go on and on. He said that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15. We could keep going on, saints of God. Judge the quick and the dead, it is appearing in his kingdom. We which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Job said, Thou wilt call, I will answer thee, for thou shalt have the desire to the works of thy hands. Uh, Jesus said, There is coming a day, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth, they which have done good unto the resurrection of life, they which have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Paul said, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. So all of this is beginning to come together uh, to make us understand that we're looking forward to something, not something that has happened, not something that is happening, but something that is yet to happen. He said, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, thou wilt call, I will answer, shall hear his voice and come forth with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. He said, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, which means the dead have not been caught up. The dead have not moved out of life soul. The dead are not already in heaven because when the resurrection takes place, those which are asleep in Christ and those of us that are alive and remain, we are going to be going up together to meet the Lord. He said, we shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, Paul is trying to deal with the death of someone here. He's comforting someone. And if Paul had a, a, another understanding of a moving out alive soul, if, he, if, if it was something completely opposite of what he had already understood, he would have declared it at this moment. But he did not declare that. He declared the resurrection of the dead. He declared the looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. He declared a looking to the future. And then he said, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's what Paul said, who was a preacher of the resurrection. I told you, I believe the other day, Paul was standing there. There were, there were Sadducees that were, that, that were uh, uh, withstanding him. They were questioning him. And he said, men and brethren, he said, I am a Pharisee. He said, and yet I stand question day of the hope of the resurrection. Hope, saints of God. Hope is not something that is already seen. For Paul said, what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Job said, all the days of my appointed time will I wait until my change come. For thou wilt call and I will answer thee. For that would have a desire to the works of thy hands. So this is what we're looking for. We're looking for the Lord to judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. That's what we're looking for. It is not something that has happened. It is not something that is happening. It is something that will yet happen. Our hope will be realized at the coming of Jesus Christ, at the resurrection of the dead, at the changing of our vile body. We are waiting for the adoption to wit or to be finalized 
at the redemption of our body. I'm going to stop there today and then we're going to move into part three tomorrow. But I want us to understand we're looking for something. We're looking for the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We're looking for that day. We're looking for him to come again. And when he comes again, saints of God, he is going to resurrect the dead that died in Christ. Again, do not mix up dead to Christ with dead in Christ. When we start to, when we start to use the term dead in Christ as a negative, as a wicked thing, as an awful thing as something that some someone has 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 lost out because they died in Christ you are manipulating the scripture you're distorting the word of God and you're twisting it to fit your narrative the lord said in revelation blessed are the dead which die in the lord from henceforth for they rest from their labors and their works do follow them do not misconstrued the word of God to prove a narrative. Those who have died in Christ, Jesus told the church in Smyrna, he said, only be thou faithful unto death and you shall receive a crown of life. When are they gonna receive that crown of life? Paul said, in that day. When is that day, Paul? When he shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. He said, there is now laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, but not unto me only, but unto all those that love his appearing. That is the hope of our life. That is the hope of creation, that the Lord will do what he said he's going to do, and he will return, and he will resurrect the righteous dead, we who have, have, are still alive and remain at the coming of the Lord, he is going to change our body as well and give us a body like it unto his glorious body because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. We must put on an immortal and incorruptible body. And when that happens, at the same moment, he is going to deliver the creature from the bondage of corruption and he is going to deliver them into the glorious liberty of the children of God. It is the hope of humanity. It is the hope of all creation that Christ will come, that there will be a resurrection. Because as I read to you yesterday, if there be no resurrection, then is Christ not raised? And if Christ be not raised, you're yet in your sins. We are believing and hoping and looking forward to the resurrection of the dead and to the coming of Jesus Christ and to the glorious liberation of creation from the corruption, uh, from the bondage of corruption. I'm, I'm trying to teach us this so that we can understand, saints of God, that we have no reason to fear death. Now, I wanna say this and then we're going to finish. We are looking right now, saints of God, at just a few years from major persecution coming to the church, was, which is in the United States. God has had mercy upon us. He has blessed us. He has kept us. He has used us. He has shown himself strong to us. We have seen, this nation has seen the hand of God working in its midst in a glorious and merciful and prosperous way. However, we are beginning to forget God. This nation is beginning and has been saints of God, I believe, since especially uh, the, the, the ruling of Roe versus Wade, when we legalized the killing of our children and now over 70 million children uh, that, that are documented. We don't know how many others, how many other millions that are not documented, that have been aborted uh, possibly uh, in, 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 in clinics, uh, in, 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 the, in the alleys of, of, of the cities. We don't know how many more millions. We just know that there's over 70 million children. The blood of the unborn is upon this nation. The murderous hands of, of, of predatory uh, abortionists have absolutely spilled the blood of countless millions of children in this nation since the ruling uh, or the adoption of Roe versus Wade. 
homosexuality is rampant. If you watch videos now, now the homosexuals are the moral, uh, the moral people. The homosexuals are the heroes uh, or the victims. And we who are Christians, we are becoming perpetrators. We are becoming uh, uh, the, 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 the we're becoming the instigators. We are now becoming the people that are considered immoral. Woe unto them which call evil good and good evil. That's where we are now. This nation is turning its back on the Lord. It's turning its back on God. The more governors and politicians, uh, uh, whether it be local or whether it be national uh, or whether it be in the state, the more politicians that are arising, uh, that are, are, are empowered by the enemy of the church, uh, the, the Bible said it's, it's spiritual wickedness working in high places. There is a great warfare going on right now, a great battle going on right now. Not only is it an external oppression, but it is an internal oppression as false doctrine and heresy begin uh, uh, and, and or rather continue uh, uh, to invade the church continue to uh, pervert the hearts of God's people and that they begin to serve God unrighteously and in error. They pervert the right ways of God. They turn the grace of God into lasciviousness and no longer, I'm telling you, we are moving quickly until we're going to see this universal church, this universal government, this universal economy, and it's all going to be surrounded underneath brotherly love and peace at all costs. The problem is the gospel that we preach as children of God is an exclusive gospel. It is not inclusive. It doesn't include the Muslims. It doesn't include the Buddhists. It doesn't include the secular humanists. It doesn't include the atheist or the agnostic. It is exclusive. You have to believe that Jesus is the son of God and you have to believe that his name is the only name given under heaven by which we must be saved. There are not many roads that lead uh, uh, to salvation. There are not many roads that lead to the Father. Father Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except he come through me. And if any man come up any other way, the same man is a thief and a robber. We have an exclusive gospel. Now, as this universal movement begins to take place, what is called the one world government or the one world economy or the one world church, we are going to see persecution come against the church like we have never seen in the United States. Many of our brethren and, and our sisters around the world are suffering underneath the persecution already. But it's coming because we are forgetting God and the nation that shall forget God shall be turned into hell. And I want you to understand it's going to happen to us as it ha as has happened through the centuries that the more plague and the more fallout uh, that we see coming upon this nation, the Christians are going to be blamed for it. The church is going to come under persecution because of it. We are going to be the fanaticals. We are going to be uh, the right wing crazies we are going to be the enemy and as a result of being the enemy we are going to face most certainly persecution and martyrdom we cannot be afraid of death that's the reason why i'm doing this study because you have to see the hope that is before you because if there is hope before you you will gladly endure the persecution you will glad the bible said they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods. They, the Bible said that some of them were persecuted, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. It is the hope of the resurrection at the return of Jesus Christ, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, in which he shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. That is the hope of the church. It's the hope of creation, and we are going to realize our hope. I pray that this has been a blessing to you today. If you're just joining, if you're just coming on, I would encourage you after the video is finished to go back and watch it from the beginning. Go back to yesterday and watch the part one of the hope of the resurrection. And I believe that maybe some of you will realize truly what the hope of the church is, what the hope of the children of God is for the first time. And maybe some of you, it'll stir up your minds to remember those things which you have been taught. 
Anyways, I just want to continue uh, over the next few days to lay this out uh, as the Lord will allow me to. And I pray that it will be a blessing to you. But until then, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord continue to watch over you. And may the Lord continue to go with you and before you in Jesus name. We'll see you.